lab sections that's what we're trying to do the homework for this week which is to control output devices but we're doing a video that we'll share with the okay. and for the class Chuck Koberman may be the, the best known designer of mechanisms and the best way to introduce him is to not talk but, <laughs> Thanks, Neil. Uh, so, thanks for having me. Um, great to be here. You should never start a talk by apologizing for it, but I didn't really have a lot of time to prepare. The problem for you guys is when I don't prepare, it means I have more stuff, not less. Um, but I'll kind of move through it and then maybe kind of skip around a bit. Um, so, I've um, been, uh, I'm a, by training, I'm a mechanical engineer, uh, but originally as a fine artist. And I've um, worked as an entrepreneur most of my career. Uh, with, uh, but as a, uh, you know, in a business context, it's kind of have a research specialty, which I call transformable design, which is making objects that can change size, can change shape. Where is your office? Uh, in New York City. Um, and uh, the um, idea of transformation for me is, or has always traditionally been, uh, you know, kind of, if you think about A, sort of transformation being going from state A to state B, but the particular focus I've had is to uh, focus on the process of change from A to B. So words like continuous, flowing, smooth, uh, have, I mean, I associate that a lot with, um, uh, with my work. Uh, a lot of the uh, original and really ongoing inspiration for this has been uh, through nature. Uh, the idea is that within nature, you do see this constant kind of morphing going on. So the changing of clouds uh, and of course organisms uh, are changing constantly. And it's interesting to look at that uh, idea of size change, shape change uh, among organisms over timelines, uh, whether it's over evolutionary uh, kind of time frames of one species changing its shape uh, kind of into its uh, next evolutionary embodiment, uh, the morphology of our own bodies as they change over a shorter timeline, uh, and then going into these um, kind of real time transformations of this cephalopod that is changing. Uh, size, texture, um, color, all of these things, all kind of with this desire for little fishes. Uh, and as a designer, that's kind of inspirational to sort of say, well, what if we could design things that change in ways like this, the way nature does? And, you know, for someone of my generation, uh, it was actually a revelation to find out that you could design in that way digitally. Uh, so back in like the 80s when Terminator 2 came out and the first idea of morphing in the digital space came and it was like, okay, we can design transformation, but it's digital, it's not uh, physical. So in some ways, you know, a schema that I might put on it is to uh, make physical transformative things like nature, but design them the way we do digitally uh, and bring those two things together. So I am a mechanisms designer. Um, these are prototypes and prototypes I've made over the years. Uh, what I love about mechanisms is that there's a very material, tactile quality to them, and yet there's always something that's, you know, not tactile, that's kind of ineffable, which is the motion. Or really it's um, somehow that they exemplify the relationship between parts. Uh, so uh, for me, that's kind of a nice way to think about a mechanism, is, is that it's a kind of a sort of enclosed system of embodied relationships. And in that sense, it opens out into uh, kind of a lot of interesting direction. Um, so over the years, uh, you know, within my practice, I've worked in a whole lot of different sectors, and you can look at it kind of uh, across different scales, from miniature medical instruments up to architectural scale. And there's a couple of recent examples at the extremes. These are, this is a little overloom mechanism that was uh, made in the, um, I just heard, it was for a course at MIT uh, that I do with Eric Main and Daniel LaRousse, but it was done out of the Harvard Medical Robotics Lab. So we're basically a wheel that's printed with laminated, um, laminated carbon at the scale you see. And then this is a project we're working on currently, which is uh, a retractable roof for the new uh, Atlanta Falcon Stadium. Um, and in some way, in my very kind of simplistic way of looking at it, it's like, you know, you can kind of do the same thing at those two scales. And, and you can probably push it, and you can push it in both directions, definitely on the miniaturization uh, as well. Now, of course, all kinds of things change but that sort of embodied relationships uh, and working through a mechanical um, viewpoint in that doesn't. Um, again, there's some slides in here that might not even be necessary for a group like this, but 
philosophically, I've always loved the idea of invention. Somehow it's been an in-between state between expressive, creative, artistic work and scientific work, and the media lab is kind of, you're living in that uh, here. Um, uh, this is, uh, I like quotes from inventors. This is sort of a favorite of all these sort of like uh, thoughts. Uh, thought is only a clash between two long knives, but this flash is everything. And, you know, that's uh, a kind of, an, I mean, in a certain way, it's what I've always lived for is to kind of get those flashes. You keep seeking them out. It's kind of a thrill when they happen. Um, I'll show you, like, kind of a flash I had about you know, a long time ago, 25, 27 years ago which was for uh, a scissor mechanism, which really underlies a lot of the work which I'm best known for. And the animation that I'll show will pretty much explain it. So you have two straight lengths and the lines, their endpoints are parallel. If the connection point between the, between the two links is brought off the midpoint, you see a changing angle. And I made a discovery uh, at that time, which was that by angulating the links, uh, that when the linkage folds and unfolds, the uh, angle that they include does not change anymore. It becomes an invariant quantity, which allows you to create uh, a fold, a sort of a folding ring. And it's basically that closure that begins to speak to that transition from mechanism to structure, because you're getting to that point of being forced. So from this idea, um, I went on, and so, you know, in 89, this is an original part of the prototype of uh, the Hoberman sphere. And I patented uh, the idea, a couple patents uh, in the late 80s, early 90s. By the way, the patent is not for a sphere, it's for a system for making, expanding shapes, and they can be generalized into many different shapes, and began to build larger structures. And then, of course, came out with the toys. So this, when we came out with the toys, this actually turned out kind of, uh, I mean, it sort of hijacked my career for about a decade. Um, Probably in a very good, I mean, in a good way, I can't say otherwise, but um, the sphere kind of just sort of took off. So I'll show you a few of the customers that we've had over the years. <laughs> and then about, uh, I don't know what it was, um, maybe about five months ago, um, uh, my wife's aunt, Asian aunt in Florida, called up and said, There's somebody who's showing the sphere to Obama who said he invented it. And he was referring to that guy there. I don't know if this will play the sound, but this is actually from the... Yeah. You can't make this stuff up. Um, <laughs> so, uh, the, um, the, the sphere, like I say, it was, a, it was really kind of a, a, a fluky thing that became as popular as it did, and it kind of has had this, this life really outside of me, but it's got my name on it, so somehow, you know, you get kind of tracked on it. But the real thing that I've always been interested in is how do you make objects transform? And this goes back to work that I did uh, when I was at art school at Cooper Union in the late 70s. This is a people moving machine. The two people would kind of get on these platforms and seesaw back and forth. They had some idea about changing their viewpoint. It's kind of like a, an important aesthetic experience. Um, when I um, then went on to Columbia, went to engineering school, I got very interested in the idea of pop-up structures, and through that began to do a lot of kind of like origami-like explorations, and the motivation there was in a certain way, it was pretty cheap to make things out of paper and tape. Uh, and while I was working at Honeybee Robotics, which is now called Honeybee Spacecraft Mechanisms, for five years in the late 80s, we began to work with the space agency looking at uh, robotic construction of truss structures and deployable uh, structures in space. And then went on to kind of look at all kinds of different transformable objects. And, just, um, and the idea with a lot of these was just to rethink what's a window, what's a box, uh, what's a wheel. Um, you know, it's kind of a, in a way, it's a game of like, you know, something that's solid, how do I break it up into pieces uh, and push and pull on it in some way uh, to make it fold. Uh, and it's about an eight foot by eight foot wall uh, using. Uh, an invention I call thick origami, which is uh, origami made of um, different materials. Um, as a mechanical engineer, when I was going to school in Columbia, basically they spent, I mean, they actually they had a great uh, program there for, uh, for uh, mechanism design, but a lot of what they would focus on was kind of this idea of like synthesizing trajectories and all kinds of, you know, uh, you know just, com I mean, it's computation, but basically closed form uh, equations to do that. 
And I kind of inverted that a little bit conceptually in my head as I've been discovering these things to say, you know, you could think about mechanisms in a different way, but it's really about form change, not make it, the motion is there, but the motion is related to a change in form. So uh, in terms of this uh, kind of inventive process, um, I wanted this, this early invention which came out of that angulated linkage, which I showed you before, was to make expanding structures. As I mentioned, the patent was really for this, which was that you could define, basically define virtually any surface, any shape, and translate it into its mechanical equivalent. And the idea would be that the shape would expand, but not really change its form. So a sphere stays a sphere, and a spiral stays a spiral, and the robot man stays a robot man. And it's pretty much of a formulaic way that you can do that do that now. Although it hasn't been completely encoded in a, as a, as a uh, um, kind of an automated software for designers. So that's something fun that maybe some of you guys are working on space so you don't know how to do this stuff. These are some minimal surfaces, uh, versions of expanding structures. And you can see that the profile from the viewpoint of this hyperbolic paraboloid, it always has this kind of butterfly structure, but if you move around it like any like any three-dimensional shape, the profile changes, but that expanding profile always remains consistent. And here's another one that I did in this series uh, of a helicoid kind of spiral structure. Um, and what you can see here is that it's expanding uh, in straight lines. They're actually the trajectory is actually they're all straight line motions coming out from the center. So it's kind of like an expanding universe, sort of a notion. So if you do a time lapse photograph of these things, you get these nice lines coming out, and they're very useful for supporting larger well. As you build these things larger, you begin to think about their structural, uh, uh, the structural story that you're telling. So this is a geodesic dome. It looks like a geodesic dome, et cetera. It is a geodesic dome. It's triangulated. It's dome-shaped. It sits on the ground. Uh, it supports weight. It looks like a bunch of fuller dome. And as I build larger structures, uh, you know, you have to think a lot about just conceptually how do you make these things safe and secure. And when you work, I work with structural engineers a lot, and the classical structural engineer says, you know, if it's going to be safe, it has to be stable. If it's going to be stable, it means the deflections are small, they're within elastic limits of the material. But if you're making a big kinetic structure, the deflections are equivalent to span, they're kinematic deflections, and you have to kind of think that through of what's the stability defined as the process, uh, not as the state. So here are some kind of more architectural projects. This is a dome that was built for the World's Fair uh, in Hanover in 2000. It's about 20, 20 feet across, powered by four hydraulic cylinders. And then uh, going up a little bit in scale, this is a curtain that we did for the Winter Olympics in Salt Lake City in 2002. This is 72 feet across, basically as part of a theatrical experience. And uh, you know this is sort of the first test out. In Salt Lake City, freezing cold, high winds, a lot of trepidation, like, would this thing work? You know, it was 17 nights when it was on TV, et cetera, but it did. Construction photos. So, at this scale, there's a lot of focus on just the uh, constructive aspects of how to build these things. This has a, um, a track, cable underneath the track. It's moving it. Each pan, there are 48 panels synchronized by 48 links. Each one is about the size of a sheet of plywood. Uh, it's aluminum with a polycarbonate backing. And then you can see here, and it's uh, as part of the theatrical, this was basically part of the stage set, uh, integrated with lighting. And there's also music, dance, etc. And open up to uh, reveal the flame of the Olympics. We have. Um, <laughs> We continue to do work in, uh, basically for live entertainment, um, uh, but it's intermittent. Uh, it really has to be a special project. Uh, but I love working in sort of in theatrical projects because um, unlike architectural projects, and I'll show you a little of those as well, theater people tend to say yes a lot more than no. <laughs> Are not architects, but they're financiers, financiers and clients tend to say no. So the um, work that we did in live entertainment kind of reached an apex, and actually, honestly, speaking, I do think it's the apex. I don't think we're going to talk this one. This is the screen that we did for uh, for U2's uh, 360 tour, which went from 2009 to 2011. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about this. But basically, the program here was to build a transformable video screen. So uh, it was the shape is a kind of a con elliptical shape in plan, a kind of a conical shape, uh, so kind of conical ellipse, and the um, 
uh, the size is about 75 feet high and 75 feet across. What you're seeing in this rendering is the dense blue is high resolution video, not a projection. So you have a high resolution sort of funny shaped video screen on the left and then it would expand over the dam on the right. So uh, this was um, uh, created by the late, great uh, rock set designer as well as you know, and other things, Mark Fisher. Uh, he concepted this whole idea, and it was called Mutant 360 because it's theater in the round, and they designed this thing called the Claw, which uh, would sit, was basically transported to different stadia uh, around the world in arenas, and you can see it's about, it's the size of just, you know, it's like the size of a bridge, it's infrastructure. It's 200 feet across, 80 feet high. They built three of these uh, so that they could basically be setting them up in frame in one stadium while the band was uh, playing in another, but everything else that was built was just one. So this was clad with fabric. Uh, there was a stage which had these kinetic bridges so the band can play on the middle of the stage with kind of these horseshoe elements. Uh, the speakers themselves. Oh, did anybody see this? Uh, see the show? Great. Uh, the speakers themselves are like how the story's behind. I'm not a big rock arena fan, but I saw the show like about six, seven times. It's really, really great show. Uh, and we were asked and tasked to make a transformable video screen. And, you know. What may you ask is that? Well, that was kind of like what we had to come up with quite quickly and then sort of implement it quite quickly. And this whole project went for about a year from concept to completion. Um, this is a sectional view of the, uh, the truss that uh, the claw structure that holds the screen with the, uh, with the screen suspended from it. And it's really only to give you a flavor of kind of the extreme engineering that went into it, just layers of mechanics, you know. Uh, and, uh, uh, and electronics uh, going into it. Um, it's, uh, you know, roughly 80 feet high. This is, uh, this is much speeded up. Uh, and you see it from sort of testing the, um, uh, the screen on it. And basically it was hanging like 30 tons of moving machinery and electronics over Bono's head with, you know, all done in the space of about a year. Uh, the best engineers I've ever worked with have actually been in the rock industry. I mean, by far in a certain way, uh, just in terms of getting it done, getting it done right, getting it done quickly, and with sort of the minimum amount of sort of political wrangling. And of course that does come about because there's a band that can afford all of this, that can green light things, but it also takes a lot of, um, uh, an enormous amount of courage and trust between the people, because basically you're kind of dependent on other people not, not to screw up. And I was very lucky that I was kind of led into that situation without a whole lot of uh, sort of background. This is a, it's a time lapse show that somebody sent me recently that one of the, uh, the touring guys uh, made. Uh, so it's not the best way to see the show, but uh, it gives you kind of a flavor of um, all of the different uh, kind of, um, colors and moves that were part of it. Um, pretty random order of slides. We're working on this uh, Atlanta Falcon Stadium. Uh, again, this will be. Um, uh, a, uh, uh, an opening, uh, uh, a roof that opens up with about a 500 foot opening. Uh, it has eight moving parts. You can see basically an animation of how it's moving here. So it's creating a kind of a camera aperture, but not with rotary motion, but with sliding motion. Uh, in the world of retractable roofs over Stadia, this is a huge innovation. Um, most retractable roofs are basically just static roofs on wheels. Um, we're in the middle of it now, I and mean, we're basically a we're called a mechanism consultant within the team, so I don't have an enormous role, and this was a collaborative concept. Uh, but just to give you a sense, you know, these pie slices are like, basically, like 300 foot cantilevers. Um, they're cantilevers, even though they look like they rest on each other, like the Oppenheimer symbol, they don't, because you can never do that because of all the sort of expansions, reflections, et cetera, so they all have to kind of hang there in space and hold their own, although it gives us incredible image. So I'll keep you up to date on what, what happens with this. It's due to be completed in 2017. Some other architectural work is some work we did with Foster and Partners for a retractable roof in, uh, in Abu Dhabi. Um, we, uh, this is the, the built roof here, and you can see it's kind of a window mechanism where the window pane is just white. So there's basically layers of laminated grid that are opening and closing. Uh, around um, Around 2007-8, I began to get very interested in this idea of transformable surfaces, which I still am interested in, though we've got some new threads going now. This is something called Tessellate, which is basically 
a means of making foot rate and screen that can change its opacity where you shift different layers of screen relative to one another. I mean, we're building this on a few different projects. And then a variant on this is something I call adaptive fritting. Fritting is like a white dots on glass to control solar gain. And by doing the same trick of shifting these layers, you get these kind of descents of this kind of optical glass, but it's all done through a mechanical, sort of through mechanical means. So that was actually at the, uh, at the GSD at the Harvard School of Design in, uh, in 2009. And, uh, we've done some smaller art installations of this. Um, never did it on as a real glass technology. This is a, um, uh, another architectural uh, project, uh, a model that we're uh, I'm working quite actively on now. This is a, uh, a curtain for a, uh, sort of an exterior curtain for a residence in, um, uh, in Japan. Uh, this is a 3D printed model, printed as one piece. Um, the size of it is about this big, but we are, the size in real life will be about 30 feet across by 15 feet high. So we just went out to uh, Kansas City to uh, where our metal fabricator is to do a kind of an engineering mock-up. So this is hot off the presses. This is about a week old. So we just do two of the lower panels. It's basically two parallel parallelogram linkages that are interlaced with one another. Uh, we have a client in Japan. Some fun with that. So these are basically about 30 feet long, uh, stainless steel uh, perforated. Um, the end of this, I'll just talk a little bit about some uh, new, um, sort of new directions uh, in, uh, I mean, I'm calling it research, but you have to understand my research is of some of it can be translated into more technical science engineering research, but a lot of it is driven by just interesting aesthetic problems. So one of the things that's always fascinated me is um, since I had come up with this fairly general way of making expanding shapes, it occurred to me that it would be fun, it would be interesting if rather than making a small sphere become a big sphere, you know, what if I could kind of like make a small sphere become a big man or, you know, basically morph from shape to shape. So what I'll show you next is kind of like little stages along the way, I haven't solved the problem, but um, I have some ideas on how to approach it. So again, it's kind of in this uh, uh, natural and digital inspiration. Um, these are just kind of like some structures I built along the way which kind of filtered into my thinking about this problem. This is a kind of a Nautilus type of structure, which is a series of arches rolling along a lot of rhythmic track. There it's shown here. Never built this. But you'll see a lot of spinning forms. This uh, was some other kind of just purely sculptural explorations of these trees. This was done for kind of a theme park project. And then I began to, around the time of U2, we began to look at sort of like, what would be interesting stage sets? And we sort of look at ways of spinning uh, different shapes uh, or different like uh, linear shapes to kind of create surfaces that would change and transform. And so what you're seeing is actually, is mechanically quite simple, but design-wise is, uh, is really pushing. Um, Around this time, I also began to think about how to kind of provide an infill for these spinning shapes. And this is a, this is a sphere that changes into a cylinder. So what you're seeing here is, um, if you watch it, the blue shapes are actually, um, the blue shapes are kind of, um, they're flexible, but the green shapes are rigid. But basically, when you put them together, you can get a surface. And the blue shapes are, uh, they're, um, trans they, they distort their shape in a very specific way, which is basically they just shear. So this seemed like, although this is like kind of conceptual, it seemed like something that I could mechanically build. This is just another, uh, let's see, I found that one. Well, here's some, the slides are getting a little bit out of order, but these are some, I started to play with this idea in terms of um, 3D printed pieces. These are, basically playing with the same spinning idea, but going from a cube to a sphere. Here's, uh, these are definitely out of order, but no worries. Um, mechanically where this went to was uh, basically to look at making curved tubes 
that are shaped in a particular way so that you can curve them where you can make uh, shapes that um, would transform from one to the other. And I think I have an example that's more specific to that in front of you. Uh, the nice thing about this is you can actually order freeform bed spine tubes now. They have these nice machines that do it. Do you have one of those? No, but I mean, you can buy our own. Yeah, you get one and then. He's then thought very hard about making an nano version of that machine. Yeah. Well, they have that, that, that one though. It's a think it's, um, it, it, it doesn't have. It has um, like limited degrees. Of freedom. Yeah, I think it, I think you get you get planar first. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's it, we worked with these guys some, and the, the trick is it's all cold forming. So they, if you want to make it, if you want to get close, you have to let them make a few because basically they have to make it, digitize it, see where the error is, and make it again because all the steel responds slightly differently. But uh, it's totally cool. So we began to play with this from, uh, we had a client who did these sculptures for transformable shapes. I'll show you those. This is, uh, this is basically um, 30 identical uh, stainless steel tubes that are spinning around their own axis. Um, and you get this kind of cool effect of an overall shape change and all this kind of more uh, stuff going on. So we did this, this is about five feet long. Where we did for a client in New York. This is 30 identical tubes that just have a slightly more complex pattern. And uh, I mean, the this one still is like the optical qualities of this still surprise me. And I've had people like physically look at it and they'll like walk right up to it and they'll be like, how are you getting the tubes with that? Even though that's all that's happening is that, so there's sort of the less there that meets the eye is, 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 is a nice aspect of it. Uh, and then we medium found, skip found one, good. Um, I hope we actually, So um, about a year ago, I was part of an art competition for a uh, sculpture outside a pediatric hospital. Didn't win it, but I kind of used that to explore this idea of shape transformation a little bit. And my idea was to make a kind of a moon turn into a star. Uh, that, that would be the concept that I thought kids would like that idea. So I sort of said, well, now I have to get a little bit more complex with this to see if I can go from sort of specified shape to specified shape. So the first thing insight, which was kind of basic, was the spline of the tube has to correspond to the intersection between the two surfaces because as this thing spins, it's going to have to lie on one surface and then on the other. And uh, after kind of going through that, I did some scripting and began to kind of play around with that. Uh, and it turns out that a lot of shapes just don't work if the tubes hit each other. So that was like one of the problems. But these shapes did work. So you'll see it here is um, this is a single tube doing what you can see it doing, which is spinning around its endpoints. And then it gets arrayed with, in this case, I think there's a total of 36 tubes that are all different from one another. And they spin around and you kind of get, let's see, the moon shape coalesce. And then the additional trick that we did was we realized, well, if you spin the whole form, we can kind of optimize the viewpoint. Uh, so now you'll see all of the tubes kind of spinning around their own axis as the whole thing spins on kind of a turntable in tandem. And then you get the kind of cool thing where it turns into or star shape. Explain scripting. What kind of tools do you use? Uh, well, the tools I use, I wouldn't advise anyone else to use because mm -hmm. that's the question. What tools do you use? Um, I um, I, I script in um, uh, in AutoCAD, AutoLisp, because um, uh, I was okay. actually part don't, of don't a. Do that. <laughs> I was actually uh, I had the, sort of the honor, but also kind of the uh, it was a little bit there was a little bit of chagrin there where I was I was included in a. Show at the Canadian Center for Architecture called the Archaeology of the Digital, <laughs> and uh, with, I mean it was, it was with Frank Gehry and Peter Eisenman, so I mean it was an illustrious company. But they're actually they actually are older than me. Um, but I worked with Greg Lynn, uh, architect from UCLA, and uh, you know it was like I actually uncovered like the original programs. And uh, anyway, my computer I, I'm an old dinosaur now, but my staff uses SolidWorks and they do a lot in that, and you know, it's. Uh, it all done like that. Uh, here's uh, another 3D printed piece, which actually goes back to that original computer rendering of the blue and the green. So that was printed at, at Harvard at the Wies Institute. And uh, we had a lot of fun doing my 3D printed mechanisms, just kind of, you know, print them out as complete, um, as complete units if uh, the mechanical properties of these resin screw stuff work in your so much, that would be great. Yeah. You can do a lot of things that would be way too costly. Um, 
I'll briefly just do a plug for my class at the GSD because um, I think it does relate to uh, a great set of new relations. Um, I, uh, and so, Jonathan is part of this class. That's right, yes. Um, so um, I'm sure everybody knows about the Deese Institute at Harvard. Uh, the Deese uh, has, um, they don't have a teaching function, but they've been doing some collaborative courses. They did a materials course called Nano, Micro, Macro uh, with the GSD last year. And I had the idea that it would be great to see what the design students would do with, uh, with robotics. Uh, and so I tried to come up with a term for what would capture what I see a lot of trends in robotics. I came up with the idea of informal, informal in the sense of using folded paper, gels, soft materials, not big mechanical actuators. Um, and Rob Wood, who's the, uh, one of the leads of the robotic platform and has his, the micro robotics lab at Harvard, uh, we thought this was a good idea. So we've been working on this, uh, uh, working on this course. I'll show you just a tiny little bit. Conceptually, the idea is instead of robots being hard and big, and uh, is that they're soft and flexible, uh, et cetera. That's kind of this was part of the original course presentation, and uh, this is all. I, I don't know how much of this type of work you're familiar with, but I'm sure some of you have seen some of this. But the idea is the sort of a fusion of. Um, Robotic function, motion, but where it really has a much closer relationship to the material level, uh, because you're not able to simply specify, oh, we're going to make that out of hard materials and hook it up with a whole lot of technology. You're really trying to exploit um, uh, these exploit the material properties themselves. The last one is out of the white size group uh, at Harvard. This is out of the Gutter Clearing Lab at Berkeley. Uh, this is uh, comes out of uh, out of Korea. Uh, so in the course, we're actually doing a lot of stuff with uh, origami mechanisms and fun with that. Um, here you see why those wheels should transform. And I'll just show you one. We have, um, we have this one MIT student in a particular one. And the one thing I do want to show you is there was one assignment which I think much better than anything I showed you before uh, captures what we're hoping out of the um, <coughs> out of the things so I'll play this one. So this is by um, uh, three GSD students uh, who basically want to make a walking Oregon robot, and this just shows a little bit of the design development, which actually has continued past this uh, uh, this video significantly. So this is done in Organizer, Tomi Hirotachi's software to explore different folding patterns. Um, this is where they begin to try to uh, create a kind of a, a connection between the origami kinematics and then actuated kinematics. Uh, SolidWorks study, where we've done a lot of talking about just mechanical principles, degrees of freedom, where ground is, front motion transfer, that kind of thing. And then we began to kind of get this sort of rotary conversion, adding the right elements for the actuator to be attached to. So there's there's a huge amount of iteration, and the great thing is with uh, kind of these origami techniques, but also there's a lot of really smart lamination that's going on in terms of the actual construction, but you can kind of move, you can iterate uh, super quickly. And then um, you can see the details, are, some of them are, you know, pretty rudimentary, but they're, now they have a kind of a walking sheet of paper. This is very timely. Uh, this week we're covering uh, actuation and output devices and how to do uh, motor control. Uh, you know, uh, paper is a great controllable uh, kind of, you know, place to see it. Um, so there's a whole series of projects. Um, I'll send some invitations. Maybe you'll come to the uh, to the final review and uh, and, uh, and and take a look. Um, it's uh, you know the the thing that interests me from a teach from a teaching point of view, but really more broadly in my career is um, is a lot of the connections between uh, uh, you know just going back the connections between um, technology and design and um, you know of course this is an opportunity to sort of not to say like can it be taught, because it seems like that's not quite the right formulation, but can you create an environment that promotes a type of thinking and a type of collaboration uh, that, um, uh, 
allows young people to gravitate towards it. The way I would say yeah. it is, you're an existing group, but how do you do this without new? Well, and yeah, and also, I, I, yeah, I'm a product. I'm a product of like I had an opportunity to, you know, when I was a teenager, I was into art. I wasn't into technology at all, and I went to art school, and I had one professor who gave me an assignment to make a sculpture of motion and took off. And then I said, after I graduated, maybe I'll go to engineering school. It was like a storyline that was, it's not easy to do it quite that way now. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Um, Questions, comments? Again, I think the really interesting question it poses is just slide after slide is so gorgeous. And it, you make it look like it's easy to do if there's a Chuck Hoberman in the room. And the question would be, how, sort of how to generalize you? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm old fashioned and probably still, you know, I, I think that um, authorship is, uh, you know, it's like creativity is basically a potential that pretty much every half one has on some level, but we're all going to do it in our own ways in some way. Um, but that said, that's kind of generic. Um, we, uh, um, one thing, aside from maybe just having, say, courses and programs where you can be exposed to uh, looking at technology through a design lens or looking at design through a technology lens, is um, certainly uh, soft computation and software tools, I think, are shifting everything. Uh, and I'm not, I'm very slow to kind of say things like that. I'm not a big. I'm, I'm not, I am kind of always a little bit behind the curve and purposely so. But I do believe that, uh, you know, say if you look at architecture and um, how the practices changed because of parametric design and it took, you know, 10 or 15 years to get for it to be adopted in a way that really significantly made a difference, not just in how it was done, but what was done. But it's basically about creating communities that can, you know, adopt this and communicate among each other. And certainly with teaching, and I'm relatively new to teaching, I mean, I really see that um, you have to kind of, you have to create a certain intensity where the students can to cross communicate and learn from each other because I can sort of hit them, you know, flog them as hard as I want, and at a certain point it doesn't, it doesn't work for them anymore. Questions, um, comments, projects? How many people uh, work in your office in New York? Like, how, how large is your production? It seems like you do a really wide range. Uh, it's uh, it's a it, frankly speaking, it's a bit, it's it's I wouldn't say it's an illusion, but it's done. Uh, I've been um, we're very small right now, we're like four four people, mm -hmm. two of which have worked for work for me for well over a decade. Um, that's I I've been shifting my focus a little bit to to, uh, to teaching and research and. Um, as part of it, and also um, it, uh, it kind of ends up being um, more. Uh, we're 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 a company. I've never really focused on it as a kind of a growing financial entity. And at a certain point, then you realize that you're working from project to project. You kind of adapt as well. Again, that's more like. But I've been, you know, two years ago, I had about fifteen. That I had five people, and before that I had 35 people. That was one of the challenges. Um, if you were to go to the pinnacle and you were talking to the artist, what would you recommend that you would start? Like, from, in terms what, of that, so what point of what, What's the on ramp? If, if you're new to how to make, and you're new, you just learned how to do laser cutting and molding and casting design here and then over here you show these gorgeous transforming shapes sort of what, what, what are the first steps in life between and you're talking about from sort of a personal practical career point of view um, just no, no, no a hands-on technical point of view how, oh, hands -on how, how, how does somebody in the class oh, right, 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 structures right. begin to make structures that transform um it's equal parts um it's equal parts uh having uh 
you know, sort of the basic basic theory of mechanisms design and structural performance, being able to put those things together. I mean, this is you know kind of basic structural slash mechanical uh, engineering, um, along with I would say a uh, kind of a real willingness to try things out. Um, I mean, I think the prototyping part of it is huge. And a lot of that is like, um, I mean, the benefits of, you know, it's, it is something where you, uh, you, a lot of the insights come when you, when you build, and when you build mechanisms, it's like, it's when you say that it works or it doesn't work, you're not talking about an opinion. You know, you're talking about it works or it doesn't work. And that's beautiful. I mean, that's just uh, so, um, I'm like a real kidding question. He says something he showed many times is boundary conditions. So to solve an equation, you have a set of constraints and a set of variables, just mathematically. And a lot of the things he showed carefully set up, what are the fixed constraints? Yes. And then what are the degrees of freedom that you have available to move? And it's sort of trading off fixed constraints versus variable constraints. And so to, you know, a, a lot of it comes down to thinking about setting up boundary conditions. That's absolutely true. And there's different there, there's different levels of that. Certainly, if you build the large pieces, although they transform, everything is about how they're where they're connected and where those loads are going. Um, you know, I mean, any course I've ever taught, it's like usually there's the first lecture we go through sort of basic degree of freedom equations as well. And it's not because the equations themselves are that useful; it's because you have to think of things that way. Um, you really have to. I mean, it's a very the reason the way that degrees of freedom works is a, it's a it's a, it's an, it endlessly fascinates me, and it's because you never really quite get to the bottom of it because everything is always. I mean, that would be one thing I would love to be able to really generalize because I don't think you can go through any textbook. It doesn't general. It doesn't really capture the range of experience of like why you know ultimately why things there, there's so much variation. It's like notes on the piano or something. There's so much variation. Way that material responds to applied forces, and uh, degrees of freedom gets you that first rudimentary pass, but it's definitely the lens through which you look at it. Yeah, I, I found when I took your class that you could sort of almost cheat a little bit these days because we do have laser cutters and we have softwares where we can quickly change things. But for me, it was really useful just just to, to know the, the connections that you're going to be using, and then just test the links and see which ones work where you're getting, you know. You know, restriction of motion where the things were actually you know working the way you were expecting. And so I think just iteration, you know, having a fluidity between your CAD software and, the, and your manufacturing I think is the really good kind of Also if you haven't done it yet, um, learn inverse kinematics. So Sol SolidWorks certainly Blender actually has really good inverse kinematics that let you pin a series of constraints and push on it's, something. Yeah, no, that's them. that's great. That's great advice. I mean a lot of the design students I work with they don't really they're not adept at uh, models and it's a pity because you know you can get them to model their mechanism but they don't actually develop uh, they're not you, you can iterate you can you can actually do a lot of like virtual prototyping you know within a solid works and then kind of that just enables your physical prototyping. So I think that was one of the great things about you know the, the MIT student body is, is more gets that much more Anybody doing interesting mechanisms for final touches? Or boring mechanisms. <laughs> <laughs> or, or thinking about doing interesting mechanisms. I, I just wondered if anyone's ever put one of those custom pipe vendors suspended it on a uh, cable cam system so that you could actually, like a spider, extrude as this moved around a very large volume and then laid out huge structures uh, in pipe, in very rigid. Um, not yet. That's what I'm thinking about. The lens sections are, are, are you know, really stiff. The, the, the large yeah. forces to do what it's showing. But if, if you were to relax, I'm not sure that I'm not sure that you. But, it, but it's an intriguing idea because yeah. you probably could if you didn't. If probably if you took out the accuracy requirement and all you have to do is develop a very large force with very low, it, it's, it's very localized. The force application mm -hmm. It's all about a localized force that travels along the, uh, the tube. So it, I think it's difficult. To We've been calling this the shape shooter, and we keep debating a significant effort. Um, well, it'd be great, you know. They, 
right now it's you know you basically get a straight tube in whatever length you can and it's very straight and they kind of feed it through but if it could come off the coil instead it's the idea that you can kind of have continuous feed yeah or i see i was just reading that quickly and the person who wrote the book about the machine shop starting from the iron ore you know that book uh, oh no, it sounds good though. Oh my goodness, you know, since there's a wonderful book I'll send you about this sort of this guy who became obsessed with making a machine shop starting from a charcoal furnace and ore. No, it's not, it's not somebody, is it somebody who has like a community out in somewhere where he, he basically says that you need all the means of production? Like, no, no, uh, it's, it's, it's just, he was interested in this bootstrapping of you melt the ore and you make, start to make alloys and then you refine the alloy. And then you, the question is sort of this, this bootstrapping of precision and how, how, how you bootstrap precision to eventually make a machine shop. If no. you don't know that, I'll send you the link to it. No, it sounds great. So but basically, the, the really interesting version would be um, iron ore goes in one side and, and shape the other side. Yeah. Um, uh, or, yeah, I'll see you in the clap. I'll send that to that. So is this? This is the how so, to make anything. Yeah, so or? that the how to make anything has, has grown to these four sections, and you know, maybe I think uh, sixty some students taking it, and then in the you know maybe fifty some. The staff is almost as many as the students. Once we populate all the sections with enough stories, um, and so one, I'll, I'll send you a note for when we're going to do the open house where they all show what they do. And is the philosophy of the class like? Is it? Is it? Uh, uh, is it based on creating like singular projects, or is it is, sort is, of like that? that is you anybody do? online? Yeah. Just give me a computer with a web browser. So, uh, um, this is what we cover. So each week, we zip through each of these topics. So um, one week, one of, this, one of my favorite processes is quick turn by the Casper. Machine, machine, will act cast the mask and materials in that. So we cover the materials, processes, things like that. And then the assignment, they're always under constraint. This is design the mold and make something. So, um, let's see, that class. Uh, Jonathan, what he did was, uh, he wants to make uh, loaded dice, you could say, programmable dice. And so he did this really neat exercise of machine machinable wax, um, cast elastomers, and then this is a mold design that lets you um, cast dice. And then, um, let's see, another, for that week, another student, the Ling Li. Um, yeah, so she did uh, two things for molding and casting. She wanted to make these sort of flowy shapes, and so uh, machine, machine, wax, and then cast these parts in it. So that's now not a rendering, but that's the output. Oh, these are, and, and these, are assign these, are, these are for assignments along the way? Or no, this is, a one, this is all in one week. The assignment for that week was design a mold and make parts. Some of them, they're on the way to something bigger. Some of them, they're standalone things. And then she went on and did a second one, which was uh, food safe cooling to make um, nesting chocolate. Nice. And so all of that will be a, in a single week. And then each student does final projects where they take all the things they're doing and integrate them into something bigger, where you have to integrate all these levels of description. And so, in fact, I think it was Jonathan last year. Um, Mustang? Yeah, wasn't that him? Yeah. Okay, so Jonathan did a classic final project last year um, where, um, 
his final project was a moss pad, which was a um, capacitively sensed touchpad mouse made with moss. Right. And so it's a good example of you have to make the, the, the circuits, the sensor, the interface, um, the physical form, the code to talk to it. I'm curious about the, and, uh, what's the process by which people uh, develop these kind of concepts? Um, or is that just kind of like you've like you had the background? No, no, no. Well, it's, so anyway, so th th this now shows the. Um, oh, let's see. Uh, maybe I'm at the wrong video. The. Um, you go to the second video. Okay, yeah. So th this is the finished one now. This is the. Uh, the finished moss pad. Ah! Um, and so that's a great example of a final project where the whole point of it is to integrate all these different levels of description. And so the, the way we do it is um, each week students present what they did in that week. So we spend an hour and a half just going through what succeeded, what failed, what we learned. Each week we then teach something new. Then they pan off into these sections. And then the sections are these work groups of about 15 people um, that are very intensely collaborative. And then there's this, um, in doing the class, uh, um, we have these now, these three sections at MIT, and then we have this army of past people from the class mm -hmm. who, who then populate the sections. And so it ends up being very intensely collaborative, both in the weekly sections and then, then in the collective reviews. And then kind of every year there's this really wonderful phase transition where people collaborate all over the place and then you know tend to keep and that's part part of what primes the pump of the, of the next year coming. One comment about the class is that we document all our work mm -hmm. in this archive and that I think is the most it's a really wonderful setup of the class. We even look to see what everyone did previous years that inspires me for us yes. but also so like helps us figure out what to do differently. Yeah so uh, um, uh, we tried all, all, all different sorts of versions from uh, ways knowledge management systems, and we're always tripping over a knowledge management system's notion of how to work. Mm -hmm. And so we ended up with something deceptively simple, which is just distributed version control. So it's an archive that we all share, and everybody has a copy of it, and you put your work in it, and people build sites in the archive. And so a surprising number of like web searches lead into these archives, and everybody kind of builds these sites through the semester. Actually, everything week. leads to it. When you, for a specific week, when you look for things related to that week, you'll always get to the archive. Yeah, yeah. and so the, it's like we're all the, the only ones doing like bold and casting. Yeah, and so the, these, these archives end up being really useful repositories. Of, of, it's very different from the litany of blogs, forums, which we moves, but it ends up working really well. Just have this common thing that we all get. So we found a lot of like uh, outside, outside people into the. Well, all sorts of all sorts of searches. You know, lead you into uh, the, you know pages in the class archive. Um, yeah, so there's a couple of things coming up. There's a uh, open house for the final class. I'll invite you two to come see the project. Great, um, the 16th, okay. if you're around. Um, then there's another thing, which is now that we're up to hundreds of fab labs, we've started a version of not com, um, dot or um, we started a version of doing this in the Fab Lab network, um, where, uh, in fact, expanding at MIT and Harvard was a back action. That we started doing the class using the whole Fab Lab network, not online distance. Students are in labs and work groups with mentors, machines locally, and then we would connect them. And we figured we only had one one section of the class at MIT, but hundreds tried to become one of the people. So we figured if we can do it in all these places around the world, we could sort of do it locally. <coughs> and so expanding to multiple sites at MIT was a back action of expanding all around the world. And so in the I spring. A, a lucky prospect, Dr. Harvard, you get. Yeah, well, you should. So in the spring, we're going to do this. Um, the, the, the global, you know, in the fall, we do the MIT Harvard version. In the spring, we do the global version. Now, the Harvard one is a thin wedge. Harvard's had nothing like this, but a lot of people wanted it. And so, this is a very much a bootstrapping. But a lot of, but a lot of people at Harvard are, it's timely. It's are timely hoping that, that it's, it's a wedge and it'll 
Yeah, yeah no, I, 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 it, it will be because we're going to get a lot of time. Yeah. And then the uh, last thing, and I'll add you to a thread for this, is once a year all the uh, labs meet, which is really fun because we, last summer we brought 50 countries to Barcelona. We make the smaller for the world. And so it's coming here 20, August 2015. Hosted by MIT, Boston, Somerville, Cambridge, Harvard, and so that'll be it, you know in the backyard a global version of that. So I'll add you to the thread for that. Because, actually, um, if, if, if is it okay to share your email address with the class? Yeah, yeah, it's just okay. my name, Chuck at Fogelman. So what we'll, we'll just I'll send you a note um, with the book I mentioned and CC the class if they have follow up. Yeah, class is planning on teaching after informal robotics. Uh, you mean while I teach it again? Um, yes, are you teaching a class in spring that's different from informal robotics? Uh, spring is a little uncertain. I mean, it's a, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm slightly in flux in terms of like what, uh, uh, what's coming up, but I plan to be more, more not less involved with ah. Harvard and Boston generally. So here's something you could do. Um, Every few years, I teach a class on machine building. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, which is now not fabrication, but machines that make machines, how, right. how to build machines. And um, this year, um, James has done a lot of work with uh, one of my students, Nadia, on not just machines, but modular reconfigurable machines. Right, right. That was, um, and that was in your project, right? There. Yeah. And so one interesting thing could be you know, questions like making a shape shooter that flies around. Uh, the spring yeah, class could you know, be a fun thing. And that's another aspect about the robotic class I was thinking about because there's a lot, like there's so many different threads to it, but one of the threads of this sort of informal robotics is the idea of self-formation. I mean, it's coming up, you know, the Mies Institute is an influence on the idea of self-organizing uh -huh. systems is important. Um, so that express, that's expressing itself with sort of, you know, you, Principal robotics, principal chi, it forms itself, mm -hmm. electronics on board, and now function. So that's a machine that makes machines. So in a way, it's sort of like, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, it's if you kind of look at that and it's kind of like, okay, it gets printed, it forms itself, it's functional, but somehow it, it probably extended more. Right, than so that, the idea right? of the spring class would be rather than just being on the receiving end of 3D printer output, if you could design the machines that make the mechanisms, how would they change? And, exactly. yeah, and there's sort of a loop of how, how the mechanisms would let you make the machines that make the mechanisms. I mean, and Norman would love it. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay.